Welcome back, or hello for the first time, to my Ben 10 retrospective series. While these videos are split up as standalone pieces of content, this is part two of my three-part series with the next part eh, coming real soon. In the last video, we had our introduction to the series in general and everything that encompasses the original Ben 10, from the original series to the video games to the movies and even a game show or two. I've gone Ben 10 crazy myself. I've even purchased some vintage Ben 10 trading card booster packs and I'm not gonna open them. Today, however, we are going to continue our journey into the world of Ben 10, jumping now to the time when Ben grew up a bit thanks to a time jump between the original series and Alien Force. Cartoon Network wanted to get some new ideas flowing into the world of Ben 10, now adding Glenn Murakami, a veteran in the animation space who worked on shows like Teen Titans and Batman Beyond, who in turn hit up Dwayne McDuffie, a co-founder of Milestone Media, which gave birth to his work on stuff like Static Shock. Together, they were tasked with finding some ways to revamp the show, opting to mix the mysteries of the X-Files and the gang of problem solvers of Scooby-Doo into what Ben 10 could be, fighting back against the network who wanted it to be a bit more toned down and poppy like the original series was. Both Glenn and Dwayne would work on Alien Force and Ultimate Alien, with Dwayne McDuffie sadly passing away before the completion of Ultimate Alien. This is the part that may be the longest of the three videos, as not only does the show itself feel a lot more serious here, but the story, lore, and character building ramp everything up to another level, building upon the things within the series that definitely needed some work. We have two main series to talk about within the video, Alien Force and Ultimate Alien. While Omniverse technically is still a continuation after Ultimate Alien, that will be saved for part three, where we discuss the changes made to Ben 10, which include Omniverse and of course the full-on reboot of the show simply titled Ben 10. And clever. So, as we explore the series of Ben 10 being older, we get a look at the bigger picture. How big is the scope of Ben 10? Heck, we even get a look at another live-action movie from Alex Winter, who did the first movie we discussed in the first video. So, strap yourselves on a new Omnitrix, it's hero time. The original Ben 10 set the initial benchmark as a staple cartoon for Cartoon Network, finishing its run of four seasons in April of 2008. Continuing to adapt with the times, a thing that Ben 10 shows a consistent track record of doing between different show iterations, made a major jump from the end of the original series to Alien Force, premiering directly after the original ended. Alien Force would start the run of the older version of Ben himself in April of 2008 as well. A bold move, but a smart one to keep the fans interested and engaged in the franchise, essentially saying that, hey, we know you like this, but this just ended, so here is more of what you like, just a slightly older Ben and friends being at the forefront. Why this worked when it did is that it aged with the initial fans of the show. You're growing up in real life, and through the passage of time, Ben is growing up as well. Rather than being 10, Ben is now 15, and now has to deal with more complicated problems with a more mature mindset. Kind of. I mean, it's still Ben, after all, but it at least there was a noticeable character difference between those crucial five years in his life we skipped through. A little bit of something familiar, a little bit of something fresh. So, Ben 10 Alien Force, the second Ben 10 series, returns us back into Ben's mid-teenage life along with Gwen. The only difference here is that they are not heroes anymore. These ex-heroes turned normies now go about their day-to-day -day living through their lives as regular teens would, dealing with everyday situations like school. But this is Ben 10, and if we wanted to watch a show about teens dealing with school drama, you could literally watch anything else. The family drama is why we are all here, though starting with the information that Grandpa Max has gone missing, setting up a return to the hero life for Ben and Gwen through uncovering the mysterious alien conspiracy of the DN aliens. That's literally the coolest name ever. The DN aliens are these fusion of host bodies that are forcefully taken over by Xenocytes, a manufactured creature made by one of the first known species in the universe, the hybrids, as a way to transform the vessel they take over into what is known as a DN alien, very much acting like a parasite, giving the 
hybrid an army of servant soldiers that have no say in the matter of what they're doing or are now a part of, setting up one of the story's biggest threats right off the bat. We can speak further to this a little bit later on. While Grandpa Max is missing, he's still there in spirit thanks to his scattered out cryptic messages explaining that he's got everything handled. But do you really, Max? Do you really? But these messages only encourage Ben and Gwen to get back into the intergalactic field once again. We also see that Ben has retired the Omnitrix, giving him the chance to live a normal life for a bit and have an actual childhood that doesn't involve fighting aliens or turning into them. He does get caught off guard by a DNA alien, and with no watch upon his wrist, he's essentially powerless and properly fighting back to take this thing down, only winning this altercation by scaring the DNA alien off with a fire extinguisher. Ben then learns through the hologram of Max that the Omnitrix is with him as we get a split second look at the hologram turning into a DNA alien in which Ben doesn't take notice of. But Ben knows that the Omnitrix is still with him and goes where he had it hid to make sure that he is the one who in fact does have it. Also in that message from Max, he says he's going on to investigate the return of alien activity. Spoiler alert, when would that ever stop? Clearly things were still going on while Ben was busy at school and playing soccer, but regardless, Ben is conflicted with what this situation calls for in general. Now having the option of letting Max handle this on his own or finding the Omnitrix in his room and putting it back on. It truly feels as if there has been this struggle, the normal life or the hero life. Being able to grow up, have relationships, build friendships, be with your family, or sacrifice a lot of those things to do in your heart what feels right versus what feels selfish. Even though he has no obligation to be Ben 10, he still sees the greater good in being this great protector. A sense of purpose that the mundane day-to-day -day living hasn't fully given him during his time away. We see this play out as he speaks with Gwen. Does Grandpa Max want him to put back on the Omnitrix or not? Should he do it or not? But a shadowy figure that has been watching Ben appears asking Ben for the Omnitrix, ready to get it at whatever cost it takes. So when Ben doesn't oblige, he attacks Ben. But just because Ben doesn't have any powers at the moment, it doesn't mean that they all can't fight back right here. Remember, from the original show, Gwen still has her magical abilities and is able to subdue this mysterious alien, in which we find out that his name is Magister Labrid, who also happens to be a plumber himself. As a refresher, the plumbers are basically space law enforcement delivering space justice. Man. It really is just so fun to say that. Grandpa Max, for example, is part of the plumbers and is more integral to the overall story of Ben 10 than we would have expected from the older dude driving around an RV. Back to the confrontation though, Labrid ends up apologizing as it was all a misunderstanding thinking that Ben was a thief trying to steal the Omnitrix for himself. They all come to an agreement of working together to look for Max and Ben makes the ultimate decision to strap back on the Omnitrix once again becoming Ben 10. From the jump, this show clearly sets a tone that this iteration of Ben 10 isn't as light as the original series was. And that's not to say that the original series didn't have its more serious moments, it surely did, but there is just a different level of gravitas here that wasn't there before. Yeah, does Alien Force have lighter and goofier moments? For sure, but it never felt that the main focus of the show was ever deterred by it, adding a level of sincerity to who those characters are now. Ben is no longer 10, he has matured quite a bit. In some ways, he's still the same Ben, but in all the right ways, Ways to finally show actual character growth, something the original series struggled with in terms of dealing with consequences of actions or working as a team with those around him. He still struggles with that last part in Alien Force and even beyond in the following series, but he feels more open in general when it comes to any sort of team factor. It's my worst subject! Ben 10 Alien Force is coming up next. Like I mentioned, I love that we get some actual character growth in this series compared to the original. Aging with the characters was a smart move in order to mature not only the individuals, but the plot as well. Tara Strong, who originally voiced Ben, has passed the role on to Yuri Lowenthal, a choice that added some real weight to the voice of the character, giving a clear separation between Ben at 10 versus Ben at 15. Throughout the majority of Alien Force, Ben struggles with finding himself, his purpose, his reasonings, as he must become this larger-than-life galaxy to 
defender while having a lack of direct guidance in his life. Having no Grandpa Max to help be this voice of reason and mentor figure, he has to learn to be this voice of reason for himself. Literally, but that explanation is coming later. He really just has this lack of confidence that in the original series he had, and that was more so thanks to his ego. Gwen, who was voiced by Megan Smith, is now voiced by Ashley Johnson, giving a similar effect like Ben. When Gwen was 10, she always came off way more mature in her actions compared to Ben, but still had her moments of being goofier and, you know, acting like a kid. But as Gwen grows up, the more serious and concise tonal dictation becomes the mainstay for her personality. This time around, her magical abilities have become another thing she is proficient in, much like martial arts in school. Kevin Eleven makes a return to the series. We last left him as this pseudo-villain figure that always felt like a misguided youth not sure of their life, making fight-or-flight decisions in order to get by but with a twist of his absorption powers. In the original series, we don't get the satisfaction of his reformation. It's more of just making these changes during the start of Alien Force where he still deals with a darker side while trying to be something greater, and having a crush on Gwen is sure some real motivation. It's something that we get to see blossom as this series goes on, how they form a relationship that you wouldn't think makes sense until you really take a look under the hood. Gwen, you have to treat a car like you treat a woman. Go on. No, I sense I've made a mistake of some kind. Well, I never said he was a smooth talker, but what I mean about that previous statement is that they function as complete opposites, creating one whole part of two parts. Literally, from episode one of Alien Force, this new version of Kevin immediately shows a change in how he treats people. After them all coming together during the stakeout Ben, Gwen, and Labrit are doing, where they witness an illegal deal containing alien tech between the Forever Knights, which we will speak about later on in this video, and their supplier of goods, who turns out to be Kevin. But when the deal gets interrupted by Labrid, surprise, surprise, the dealers of the weapons turn out to be DN aliens themselves, causing a battle to take place where our heroes are surrounded. And Ben's watch doesn't work when it's hero time. Another big surprise there. Only instead of not giving him the right alien, it's just not working at all. Eventually, the watch finally does something, and by something, I mean transforms into a new sleek look that color matches Ben's outfit. Remember, fashion first, functionality second. He scrolls through his alien options like an all-you-can-eat buffet, but if all the food was something you've never seen before, because all of these aliens are brand new to the show. We meet our first new alien as Ben becomes Swampfire, an alien that bullets fly through, has fire powers, super strength, and can reattach limbs as they get cut off. Kevin steps in for a heaping dose of revenge on Ben for having him trapped in the void for so long off-screen, and uses his absorption powers to become full steel. Ben, however, still pretty pretty easily pushes him aside as the Forever Knights and Dean Aliens finish the deal and make a getaway. Once our group here though has Kevin captured, they have a talk about how these classified, too powerful for Earth weapons even got here, and that they have to stop these knights from having them. Now, why would Kevin help in this? Kevin, people could be hurt. Oh, yeah, there it is. I know that look. Now, as they work together to get the weapons back, or for Kevin to get his money from the deal that he never got to collect in the end, we start seeing the team relationship dynamic here form. While driving in Kevin's green and black sick whip, we get our first bit of taste of who Kevin is now, and how he defends Gwen when Ben yells at her during the drive. You know, that good old-fashioned cousin bickering is back. And Kevin literally pulls a I'm turning this car around and tells him to not speak to her like that. It really sets the tone for how we will see him from now on. Kevin's voice has shifted voice actors as well, from Charlie Schlatter to Greg Sipes, which helped in aiding this bad boy turned good, or morally gray may be the better term here. There's actually quite a lot of growing that Kevin does throughout this series and the next one, Ultimate Alien. The fact that he's the one to call Ben a jerk and have Ben agree and reflect on himself You're a jerk. I know. kinda says something in a way that they wanted to give the audience a swift reason to give Kevin a chance as a main character and see how he is different. Well, kind of different, he, he still has his moments. Once they are able to find where the DN aliens went thanks to Gwen's ability of tracking people by using some random item they've come in contact with, they discover a secret base of DN aliens working on things, as well as stuff. We get a look at Humongosaur, this hulking beast that can change size and can just beat the crap out of everything. Upon taking down this base and saving the day, the day is actually not saved because this was only one of many, many other bases setting up a grand journey for these three to go on. I say three because this guy, he dies.
Ow. Giving Kevin his official plumber's badge, seeing the potential in Kevin doing something meaningful in his life, which in turn ends up being quite meaningful to Kevin, finally feeling like he has a real purpose to fight for. Man, the first two-part special really is the best way to build how these characters have changed and how they will grow going forward. The creators jam-packed this season opener with so many little instances like this. How can you not feel the weight on Ben's shoulders? Resonate with the concern Gwen has and open your heart for Kevin. An effective and impactful way of getting the audience on board from young Ben to teen Ben. The team dynamic between the three works as a balancing act, where each person adds a lot to the other. From Ben and Kevin growing and actual friendship out of an old rivalry, Kevin and Gwen developing romantic feelings for one another, and Gwen and Ben having an overall better relationship that isn't just consisting of fighting with one another. I feel like I'm watching a team that genuinely has a purpose for coming together and feel distinctly like their own well-written characters. The main setup plot that will take up two thirds of Alien Force sets our newly put together team against the odds, having to find out what happened to Grandpa Max. Where did he go and how did the DN aliens play into the bigger picture? When dealing and taking down their bases, we see a pattern of weather machines shifting temperatures colder with a little bit of rain just for flair. They prefer a chiller climate, which may seem like just a thing that they're doing as a fun little quirky detail, but this plays into their further plans. Above the DN aliens are the hybrids or better known as one of the oldest living species in the galaxy, and they are extremely prejudiced against any other species out there that isn't them. Technically, their race are known as the Adasians, but refer to themselves as hybrid based on where they see themselves in terms of importance over every other alien species. They have what they deem the purest form of DNA above all else. Like I mentioned, they send out these xenocytes that attach themselves to a host and mutate them into these mixed and morphed DNA aliens, and they can spit. Okay, but he do be spitting facts though. Underneath the gooey exterior of the DN aliens are just humans, which makes the conflict Ben, Gwen, and Kevin get into a lot harder, because under the surface, these are innocent people. So rather than just taking them down for the greater good, Ben finds a way that actually ends up stopping the parasite's effect and save the human trapped inside, using the Omnitrix to repair their DNA back to normal, killing off the connection from the Xenocyte. The hybrid use these Xenocytes as a weapon in their goals of preserving serving their species. Over a long span of time with essentially no genetic diversity, the hybrid's immune system has weakened them greatly. You can sneeze on them and their bodies couldn't handle it. This whole situation has left these self-titled superior beings in a sterile state, meaning that they can no longer create offspring. I guess you can say, you're not gonna go far, kid. Four people will get that joke. Anyway, in order to, you know, not die out and have their species end, they come up with some plans. Plan one, take out all the other species in the universe to go down with them. If they can't exist, you can't either. The other idea is sending out these xenocytes to mix their hybrid DNA with other species to cleanse the galaxy of the gross other alien species DNA. Ugh, just so that their greater than everyone else DNA can live on. The only combatant to this is Ben and those repair abilities. But the hybrid aren't just stopping there. In fact, the big plot for them revolves around building some sort of warp gate between their world and Earth so that they can directly take over wiping us all out. It's what they're doing to many other planets and their inhabitants. Which now we circle back to the weather towers being built. It's similar to terraforming a planet to be sustainable for your species to live hence them wanting a cooler temperature. Through this arc in the show, we do catch up with Grandpa Max. Briefly, he seemingly sacrifices his life to take down a hybrid base as Ben, Gwen, and Kevin give some emotional reactions to it. What? No! Wow. Yeah, they really cared about Grandpa Max, it seems, but uh, to be fair, he's not really dead. I mean, for now, to the audience, and to them, he is, but he comes back a whole season and a half later, in a very climactic way, may I add, bringing with him a whole new slew of plumbers in training from around the galaxy. Also, Azimuth returns, you know, the creator of the Omnitrix. Through this chess game of taking out the DNA aliens and thwarting the plans of the hybrid, Ben and company end up recruiting others to their team who all have some sort of 
of alien DNA already a part of them, Ben 10's own little Avenger squad if you will, or Alien Force, which is why the show is called Alien Force. Aside from the main three we already know, the team ends up consisting of Julie Yamamoto. Ben's love interest slash girlfriend, she ends up joining in a pretty fun and more accidental way and she's not part alien, she just plays tennis. She plays tennis, I play tennis, call me Ben Tennis son. All right, I'm out. See you later. Video over. But on a date that Ben and her were on, they end up getting interrupted when some strange creature is causing chaos, which has Ben become an alien and Julie seeing this, but kind of being into it. Hey, to each their own. But this little creature ends up being misunderstood and not really a threat at all. So Julie ends up adopting it, naturally, naming this creature Ship, because this creature can turn into one. Now that's pretty cool. Being a galvanic mechamorph, Ship is able to change its form frequently. Julie herself is a good character in the efforts of showing who Ben is and how he grows or his lack of growth. Through their relationship in the series, we see ups and downs and it's something we will touch more on later when speaking about Ultimate Alien. Alan Albright is a part human, part Pyronite 10 year old, very clearly resembling one of Ben's original aliens. In fact, the first alien we ever see him turn into, Heat Blast. His character has some heavy ties to Kevin and this group called the Amalgam Kids, which is something we will go deeper into in part three of this series when we discuss Omniverse, where that storyline is expanded. Cooper is someone who we met in the original Ben 10 series as the grandson of another plumber who has the ambition to help out and here he returns in glorious fashion, wielding a giant robotic suit. Professor Paradox is a professor, but one who can travel through any point in time and space. His character is great and serves a bigger point beyond just this part here on the team. But for his backstory, thanks to an incident at Area 51 in the 1950s, he was ripped from reality, being able to never age and be anywhere at any time needed. Michael Morningstar, a high school girl manipulator who lures them out to drain them of their energy. He's a creep and mainly sucks, pun intended. But later on, they need him for the final fight, so they just let him free. I'm sure this idea won't backfire later on in another series. This was the final main group working together to take down the threat. But there is another side character that I want to directly highlight as they have some major relevance to the whole arc. At one point in the show, Ben and a hybrid get stuck together on a hostile planet and have to work together to survive. This gives us a great look at Ben's growth in general and how he much prefers to use logic and start a dialogue rather than his fists, but he still will use those as often as he can. He calls this hybrid Rhiny as a nickname and throughout the events of survival, we see how different ways of thought and perspective can play a major factor in the grand scheme of things. There is a moment when Rhiny gets his arm cut off and Ben uses swamp fire to fix the problem. This was a pivotal moment moment where Rhiny is conflicted on his and his species ideals. Why would the enemy offer an extending hand, no pun intended, of support like this? This hits him hard, so much that when they are able to get off the planet, Rhiny stays behind to be alone with his thoughts to work out these mixed emotions he's having. This is all important in just a minute. Through the course of the show thus far, we've had to follow Ben as he is low on confidence but has to carry everything with him. He has to step up and be a leader. It becomes this struggle of what he feels he should do versus what his mentors would tell him to do and not knowing what to do in general. He does his best, however, and when the final confrontation starts with the hybrid, rather than listening to Asmuth's strategy to just defeat them, even with Asmuth giving him the master controls, which unlocks the full use and potential of the Omnitrix. Ben chooses to do the opposite, to just do it his way, and that is in the form of compassion and for the confrontation not ending in an all-out fight. He speaks with the leaders and extends a solution that works for everyone. What if there was a way to keep the hybrid species alive and well without all the killing of planet inhabitants or mutating them into DNA aliens? We've seen how Ben is able to heal the humans back from said DNA aliens, so he uses the Omnitrix to to heal the weakened DNA within the leaders completely fixing the DNA and genes that were pulling their species down. But what really seals the deal is when Rhiny shows back up from his alone time in all emo music playlist, telling the leaders the kindness that Ben has shown him and has given him a new perspective. They all agree with the points that Rhiny brings up and they appoint him to be the new leader of the hybrids to help usher in a new era of peace and love, as their species is able to live on thanks to Ben's efforts. Grandpa Max tells Ben that there is nothing more 
he can teach him or Gwen or even Kevin, giving the team their own sense of respect for how they've come together and how Ben navigated the final battle by avoiding the battle. The only way that this was ended was because Ben chose to not listen to his mentors, finally becoming his own person and showing true leadership in the face of impossible odds. This ends the first arc of Alien Force taking up the majority of the Alien Force series. And while the big evil plans were stopped, Ben's ego starts to creep back up on him. Coming up next, it's Ben 10 Alien Force. Before we go into the second arc of Alien Force, I thought we should familiarize ourselves with all of the aliens that Ben has and acquires in this series. Ranging from a whole new set of 10 aliens plus more additional aliens and some returning friends from the original series. Since we saw Swampfire first in Alien Force, let's start there. He's a Methanosian, a plant-like being that can ignite a flamethrower essentially out of his hands. Or vines, or whatever they are. It's okay, it'll grow back. Well, that'll grow back too. He's like the regenerator in Resident Evil 4, because he can regenerate. Being able to reattach and put himself back together when he gets blasted and cut up. Echo Echo is a Sonorosian. He's cute, he's annoying, and he can multiply. Being able to create high-pitched frequencies so powerful, there's almost nothing it can't do because of it. Doubling or tripling or whatever numbering it, because like I said, he can multiply into a bunch of independent clones, thus combining to make a literal wall of sound. Humongosaur is a Vaxasaurian, resembling a big, bulking, dinosaur-like build. Aside from just having some very powerful strength, he can either increase or decrease in size and mass depending on what the situation calls for. He's just a giant ball of pure raw power, and is the muscle alien Ben often goes to to take care of so many problems they face. Chromastone is a Crystal Sapien, built very tough but also practical as energy-based attacks just bounce off of him. Unless he wants to absorb it, he can just do that. He can then channel that into laser-like beams from any of the protruding shards around his body or from his hands, like a normal laser firing alien would. He also has a strong connection to another alien species, the Petrosapiens, which is Diamond Head's species of alien. Big Chill is a Necrophygian, who looks like a big blue bat. He's able to fly, of course, as well as creating a tunnel or stream of wind that can lower the temperature and turning things into ice just by touching them. Similar to Ghost Freak in the original series, Ben starts dealing with some weird feelings from Big Chill, to the point where he would black out and Big Chill would fully be in control, but rather than Big Chill being evil, he was just very hungry. And for a good reason, because the big surprise was that Big Chill was pregnant. So Ben, as Big Chill, gave birth and quickly acted like he wasn't the father and never wanted to speak about this again. How positive are you that you're not 100 her father? positive. You are the father! Ah! And that's all I Brainstorm is a part of the Cerebro Crustacean species, so naturally he looks like what a crab would look like with a neck. The name makes even more sense because of the giant brain he has under his head flap things. He's insanely smart and deals in electricity in a slew of ways. Jet Ray is an aerophibian, resembling this long boy here from the Secret Saturdays, just red and with wings. With those wings, he is the most capable and fastest flying alien in Ben's arsenal. He can also shoot some green beams from his tail and eyes, making him quite a powerful and useful alien for many fights. Spider Monkey is an arachnichimp. Yeah, that makes sense because that's exactly what he is. So with all of the powers that come from a spider and from a monkey, they are both present here, like web shooting and dexterity. Goop is one of the coolest aliens out there. He is a polymorph and is not the goop that is goop, but it the little flying saucer control above manipulating the goop. It's a unique idea and a fun design. He could be squashed and splatted, mushed and mangled, but he can form around to handle those blows and re-goop himself together. From there, we get a few more new aliens that Ben is able to use, like Lodestar, a biot Savarshan who deals with magnets. How do those work? But for real, he can cast magnetic fields, magnetic pulses, and can move around almost like flying through his ability of magno-telecom. 
telekinesis. Wrath, this Tony the Tiger looking dude, is an apoplexian who houses a bunch of strength, similar to Humongosaur. His speed is quick and he can use his rage to intimidate foes when they need a proper smackdown. There's also Upchuck, but like a new Upchuck as there are two separate versions of Upchuck from the Gorman species. So this new look, the Merc version of Upchuck, is technically new. After all of that, we do get some fan favorites making a big return throughout the show, like Diamond Head, Ghost Free, Cannonbolt, and Weibing. And that's all of Ben's aliens. Yup, I didn't skip a single one at all. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Except for one, Alien X. Alien X is OP. Basically, he is this omnipotent celestial sapien, and Ben's most powerful alien. But in order to access Alien X from the Omnitrix, he must enter this pocket dimension where he is greeted by two floating green heads, all with their own personalities and representing a different voice. Bellicus is the voice of rage and aggression, Serena is the voice of love and compassion, and then Ben represents the voice of reason. All three of them have to come to a mutual agreement on how they are going to use the power of Alien X before Alien X can do anything. It's a cool concept that comes with a smart limited factor that relies on combining rage, love, and reason, making sure that this all-powerful alien can't be overused and a scapegoat for any situation. Being omnipotent, he is able to warp space, time, and reality, and just in general, do whatever. If he needs to fly, he can fly. If he needs to multiply, he can multiply. If he's 15 years too late to return a Blockbuster rental, he could just go back in time to when Blockbuster was still around and return it like a good Samaritan. Oh man, he forgot to be kind and rewind. Take back all I said. To go over everything Alien X can do, can't do, and the amount of lore and importance he has from this series, the next series, Omniverse, and beyond would be longer than this video itself. But regardless, I'll say this. He's a cool concept that comes with a really cool twist, and the Celestial Sapien species itself has more ties into the next series, Ultimate Alien. So while we took a good look at the main story with an alien force being the hybrid issue, there still was another smaller arc that would wrap up the series. And if I'm being honest, it's kind of a mixed bag in comparison versus the more thought-provoking and complex storyline we just had. It's also full of a bunch of filler-esque episodes, but a lot of them do prove to be interesting and just all around a fun time. Now there were filler episodes during the first arc as well, so I don't see it as a fault. Some noteworthy episodes of the series include an episode where Ben and Gwen get grounded as Ben gets caught by his parents in a battle with a hybrid and he goes into alien form. It's just silly to think that Ben, who has already gone through all of this stuff at 10 and now 15, is still getting grounded by his parents. It's hard to forget that he is still just a kid who has a curfew and school and whatever else his more mundane day-to-day -day would consist of, like going to Mr. Smoothie. Ooh, they must have really good insurance. Funny, that reminds me of Mega's XLR, where they constantly blew up fake MTV references as a petty joke that is still so funny to watch. We also get to see Verdona, or better yet, Ben and Gwen's grandmother. Yeah, so it turns out Max just has a thing for aliens. Like, we already know from the original series his space bed escapades with Xylene, but in that interim, he spent time with the purple magical anodite, Verdona. She comes into the series as a villain for them to deal with, but by the end, it runs oddly, but greatly wholesome, where she was just happy to spend time with her grandchildren. So this means that Max's kids all have some sort of alien DNA in them, and now all of their descendants, like Ben and Gwen, have their own special spark, which explains why Gwen was able to conjure magic out of just reading some spells, which is kind of an explanation for the concept of mana, a powerful energy inside of any living organism that some can harness into magic, which Gwen can do because of her connection to Verdona. And through Verdona, we get a look back at her story with Max and see more of him back in his younger days of beating up alien butt and beating up alien but if you know what I'm saying. But as far as this next arc, the Ben we deal with now post stopping the hybrid is back to being confident in himself, hearkening back to the way Ben was more ego driven in the original series. He knows now that he doesn't have to rely on his mentors and can take care of stuff on his own. It's a nice return to form for him, but it also feels like a bit of a regression based on him feeling like he was growing on from this attitude. At the same time, it's still fun to see him be a bit of a brat sometimes. So even if it's a bit of a regression, 
it's okay. He's so cocky though, that he wants those master controls back for his Omnitrix. I guess the voice command feature just isn't enough for him these days. The master controls being unlocked would give him full access to the whole arsenal of aliens with no cooldown or limited features. So good old Ben tries to jailbreak it, causing it to generate an explosion that results in a couple of things, like Kevin being stuck as a mixture of a few aliens' materials thanks to his powers for a while. And also that Azmuth is not happy with Ben, resulting in a trust factor being broken between the two. Ben thinks he's ready to use it to its full abilities and Azmuth not believing that. Oh yeah, did I mention that Vilgax makes a return to the series? Last we saw him, he was the big menacing factor for Ben to overcome. But here, he basically becomes this sort of equal playing field punching bag that just gets in the way sometimes. He's no longer this major threat to Ben, just something Ben has to deal with here or there. He also needs Ben's help on his homeworld at one point, which you would think would result in like a mutual, hey, appreciate ya, let's just let bygones be bygones and I'll stop trying to defeat you or conquer the galaxy or whatever. Instead, Vilgax still is going to do bad guy things later on. We spend time on the planet Primus, where in which the DNA samples of all the aliens in the Omnitrex data is held. Also, Albedo is introduced. He was the former assistant to Azmuth that aided in his work who went rogue with his own plans of making his own version of the Omnitrix. When Azmuth told him that he couldn't have it and thinks that Ben is unworthy of having it himself, but due to making his own that replicates Ben's Omnitrix and the sample DNA of human beings being Ben, it causes him to become a literal clone of Ben and become stuck this way. This makes him utterly repulsed and needs Ben's actual Omnitrix to restore him back from this Ben clone. One of their fights results in both Omnitrixes locking onto one another, which almost caused a universe ending explosion, but rather than that happening, this happened. All of his colors are switched. He's still Ben, but negative Ben. And then Azmuth comes around to really teach Albedo a lesson, taking apart the core of his Omnitrix, leaving him trapped in this reverse Ben from which he is not too happy about. And he plans to get his revenge at some point. And that point is when he and Vilgax team up. In the finale of this arc, or for the back half of Alien Force, I like to think that arc means all random coincidences, since it feels less cohesive than the hybrid stories. Vilgax and Albedo work together to take Ben down, both seeking pure revenge. Albedo steals the Ultimatrix, a more powerful version of the Omnitrix that can do whatever the Omnitrix can do, but better. Only if you know how to properly use its functionality in selling more toys, I, I mean basically being a pilot to tease the next series, Ultimate Alien. Uh, I mean, has access to make the aliens more powerful, that's totally what I mean. No matter how much Albedo messes with it, he can't get back into his own body, he's still stuck as Ben. But with Vilgax, they set up a plan to get Ben by kidnapping both Kevin and Gwen, baiting Ben to come after them. Ben follows the trail right to them, and when he confronts Albedo, they get into a major fight where while they are both transformed into Humongosaur, you just know that this fight isn't going to be fair. They don't call the Ultimatrix the Ultimatrix for no reason. He uses it to turn into Ultimate Humongosaur. Ah, there it is. There's that tease for the next series. Ben gets defeated in battle due to being overpowered by Albedo's ultimate transformation abilities, with Vilgax giving him the chance to save his cousin and his friend if he gives up the Omnitrix. We've seen this before in the original series, but he gives it up and Vilgax now fully has control of the Omnitrix to himself. Grandpa Max appears to help out and they can escape, but the tensions between Albedo and Vilgax heat up because they made a deal, Albedo needs the Omnitrix to turn back to his regular self out of his Ben form. But you know never tell Vilgax what to do, so he double-crosses Albedo and he holds him captive. Vilgax now heads to Ben's hometown where the fight continues, but Ben being powerless gives him a chance to use his smarts rather than his fists. And we're finally going to use that helpful little voice command feature to activate a self-destruct feature. This is something that Vilgax doesn't believe he'd fully let happen, but to his surprise, Ben is willing to sacrifice the device in order to stop Vilgax, causing it to explode, knocking out Vilgax, and leaving the Omnitrix destroyed. In revenge, or the revenge of the revenge, when Vilgax awakens, he sends his ship hurtling towards Bellwood, which the engine on board would cause enough damage to destroy the whole town and anything within a hundred mile radius. During them all working on the situation to stop this, Ben speaks to Albedo and gives him a chance to leave this life behind and to be freed in exchange for the Ultimatrix. I mean, he's already trapped as Ben, might as well just give up this revenge quest too, but when he initially refuses, Ben activates its self-destruction 
destruction feature, and Albedo knows this time he isn't playing around, so he hands up the Ultimatrix, in which Ben immediately uses it to become Ultimate Swampfire. Yep, there it is, more promo for the next series. I'm picking up what you're putting down. He helps finish the fight as they pilot the ship to instead crash into water, rather than, you know, a city, a town, any form of landmass, really. As they escape the ship, Vilgax breaks it open, allowing water to pour in as he becomes his true form. A weird, big old squid looking thing. I'm sure this is totally the last we'll see of him, right? right? Anyway, that's a problem for me to discuss later on in this video, and we're not there yet. The whole team hugs it out, and thus Alien Force is over. And overall, Alien Force, in comparison to the original show, does a lot right to further the characters, and adds a lot of really cool ideas into the world of Ben 10. But on the other hand, the show felt a little less focused on the storyline since the real big storyline ended, and we are left with a lot more filler than focus towards the end. The stuff we learn and get to see through these fillers is still really good. I genuinely liked a lot of the side characters and fun moments we still got to have that felt more like the original series. And while I like everything with Albedo and Vilgax coming back, it felt like it happened all so fast, where the hybrid arc felt like it was better told because it didn't have a rushed feeling pace. Alien Force does set a new bar for what Ben 10 can be and where the series wants to go, leaving us at the end just waiting for whatever comes next. When Ben 10 ended, we only had to wait a couple of days to see what Alien Force would be. Alien Force ended in March, of 2010, and we only would have to wait a month before Ultimate Alien would come out, giving us a quick enough turnaround from show to show to find out more about Ultimate Alien since we got that little sneak peek at the end of Alien Force. However, before Alien Force ended, we were given another live action movie in 2009 titled Ben 10 Alien Swarm. So for a nice little breather in between the cartoons, let's check in on this film. Dude, I don't know if I can pound your grandma. Yup, that's right, Ben 10 is back in the world of live action, now as the older, cooler Ben Tennyson. Premiering on Cartoon Network November 25th, 2009, it came out while the Alien 4 series was still premiering. Alex Winter returns once again to helm the film as the director, now with Cartoon Network backing the film a lot more with a bigger budget, mixing that with this being during the CN Real era. A time in Cartoon Network's history where on a station called Cartoon Network, they really wanted to make anything but, offering a slew of new live action shows, and of course, what would pair better with that than putting $40 million into a live action version of their hit cartoon show, Ben 10, one more time. Now, just because the budget may be higher and the same dude is directing the project, that doesn't always equal out to a better film. Race Against Time was a campy but fun ride with familiar characters that gave a lot of fan service to fans of Ben 10. And while that can certainly be found within this movie, it just lacks a certain level of silliness. Instead, Instead, opting for a more serious in tone, darkly color paletted, and just a tad too over dramatic flair to it all. It really made me think that I was just on the wrong channel. Well, I didn't watch this on TV, that's just an over exaggeration, okay? We start the film with Kevin and the crew investigating a black market underground alien tech deal where these nano chips are at the core of the deal. The person organizing the deal turns out to be Elena Validus, a new character making her debut in the Ben 10 world that turns out to be a family friend, or at least was a family friend. Friend. Her father Victor was the ex-partner plumber of Max who is missing and she blames Max for that reason claiming he betrayed him. But of course, what's a secret alien tech deal without a random mysterious third party showing up to cause chaos all around? The secret guy here can clearly control these nano chips and a fight breaks out where the trio have to start showing off their cool powers in live action. Ben turns into Big Chill which quickly shows off the budget's effect, where the CGI in the movie, for a TV movie, looks pretty darn good. Good. Kevin starts doing his absorbing thing and Gwen starts using her magical abilities. It's an all out brawl with a lot of flair from our heroes here. After the battle, they make their way to the secret underground plumber's base with a nano chip to run some diagnostics on it and to learn more about what they are up against and wow, the base looks pretty sleek. Lots of green in here. Elena follows them to the plumber's base and Max rushes in to make sure that she leaves and never comes back to bother them again. But she just wants some answers. She thinks that Max betrayed her father and wants to find him 
him and Max thinks that her father betrayed him and wants nothing to do with her as an extension of her father. Ben, however, wants to go out and help her as Max tells him not to. So naturally, Ben disobeys those wishes and decides to run off or motorcycle off with her on this journey. They end up walking into a trap where they are swarmed with nanochip controlled people and instead of fighting, Ben's watch is on a break and can't take any calls right now. So these two must fight their way out of this trap and escape with as little conflict as possible. It would have been cool to get at least a smaller little alien fight here, but all right. Gwen and Kevin don't initially want to be a part of that, but end up not following Grandpa Max's orders and begin to investigate themselves, trying to figure out the real reason Max and Victor had a falling out. And we do find out that the disagreement they had was over the same nanochips we are dealing with already, as Victor thinks that there is something more sinister about them, and Max just wants him to drop it and leave it alone. So rather than just look into them and run some tests, he just turns his back on Victor and by extension, Elena. Or it could also be for the fact that he was stealing the nano chips when he left. That could probably break some trust as well. Later on, we get this really cool car chase between Kevin's sick whip and the nano chips that have formed into some giant spheres. Yeah, it's spherical. spherical. You know, for some nano balls, they are quite large. The car ends up getting flipped over and Ben jumps into action by turning into Humongosaur as he fights these balls head on. The CGI looks pretty good here and then he completely destroys Kevin's sick whip by using it as a weapon. Nice one, Ben. Good to see you're still a jerk. Now we have to make a major insurance claim. Afterwards, Max still doesn't do his due diligence in finding out what these chips truly are, as we just chalk it up to him still being hurt by Victor, feeling like Victor betrayed him. He just chooses to be ignorant to the dangers of these things and what they bring. Does Max think that he has a crush on her? But hello, what about Julie? She just not exist in this live action world? Ben definitely has some flirtatious moments with Elena, so I don't know if Ben's a player or if Julie just simply doesn't exist here. We find out that the chips are multiplying at a fast rate. They are being shipped all over the world and since they resemble insects, there must be some sort of queen nano chip bug thing, so we must go after it. Grandpa Max, however, stupidly lets the captured nano chip out and it takes control of him. Frankly, he deserves it. Something's been a bit off with him this whole movie. Kevin, even though Ben destroyed his car, gifts Ben his own car because that's what good friends do. So they zip over to the shipping factory where in which we find Elena's dad, who is in fact that mysterious man and the queen nano chip is inside of him controlling all the rest. For this battle, it has to be fought on a nano level so that the nano queen can be taken down. And the only way this can happen is if Ben gets down to nano size. So we get our first look at a brand new alien for Ben and the third and final alien moment of the film, Nanomech. We get to see him another time later on in Ultimate Alien, but this was his first introduction into Ben's alien roster. He can fly and shrink down to a microscopic level, which is perfect for this nano fight. He ends up taking down the queen in this screen vomit of CGI that feels less than stellar in comparison to the rest of the movie. And then the day is saved, just like Elena's dad, which Max gets a chance to right his wrongs with and make up with him. Max also also gives Ben the offer of taking over the plumbers, but Ben declines because he's not ready for that, nor does he truly want that. But that's not the first no of this ending. The second no comes from Gwen when Elena thinks that she's a part of the team now. What did you mean when you said we're a great team? You're not on the team. I bet you feel real dumb right now. But there was something that bothered me throughout the film, and I think I can pinpoint this to the off feeling of the way characters are handled here. For the return to live action and the movies not being too far apart in release, the original actors didn't return to reprise their roles. For Ben, Ryan Kelly fits the look and ego of Ben great, but the character overall feels like that cockiness that comes with ego doesn't hit in a charming way, and instead it hits in a pretentious, all too serious way. I didn't get that. Shut up. Gwen, played by Galadriel Steinman, is pretty good at capturing Gwen at a core level. A bit more of the emotional side here is shown rather than being more analytical but still is a good interpretation of Gwen. Kevin, played by Nathan Keyes, brings that bad boy teenage angst perfectly to the big, the, the small, the, a, 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 some sort of screen, but it muddled down thanks to the writing that they gave him. His dialogue just seems so underwhelming and not giving anything deeper to say rather than some moody responses. I mean, there was a writer's strike going on around the time, but we'll get to that in a second. Alyssa Diaz is a good Elena. There's not much to base off of her sense 
sense this was a new addition to Ben 10, but she suffers for similar dialogue-related issues, and her just being an emotional hook to the stakes of her father in the film. But I can overlook a lot of that as just a way to serious drama-filled fun time. But Grandpa Max, played by Barry Corbin, suffers from the writing in a whole different way. Throughout the whole movie, he felt off in terms of how he handled every situation. Why is he so careless in his plumber work? Why is his good-natured spirit now just replaced by a salty old man who doesn't come off friendly or approachable, or even capable of a fight like Grandpa Max would be in the cartoons? It's almost like as if he's a different character altogether. Not just slight little changes like in Race Against Time, but a full, complete, opposite version of Max here. While we know he gets corrupted and controlled by a nanochip at one point, it almost feels like something was controlling his decisions anyway. Ooh, a conspiracy theory. What if from the very moment when Max's friendship with Victor ended, was the work of the nanochip starting to control his actions and laying low as the queen gets her plans in motion? Or none of that's true when his character is just the worst, and it makes the film so off-putting compared to the rest of the cartoon series and even the last live-action movie's version of Grandpa Max. It's just a weird way to handle it, literally draining this film of a lot of the charm that makes Ben 10 work so well amongst all the action in more serious moments. If we really break down why this film feels so different, the scapegoat could be the various Hollywood guild strikes that were happening as this film was in pre-production, production, and post-production. The one that would have affected this film the most would have been the writer's strike as the main problem with this film is the writing. The story and plot are all fine and dandy, but the dialogue and character direction is just so unnatural, and it feels so out of place for a Ben 10 project. Sure, Ben 10 has had many different iterations of 2D animation, live action, and 3D animation, but what hadn't changed through all of those versions of Ben 10 are these characters at a core level. By making this dark and serious without blending that with what makes these characters special, you lose what makes the audience care about these characters, their motivations, and the plot overall. They did, however, use up that bigger budget, and the film is shot overall pretty well. Only a few scenes of intense CGI that make the action a little hard on the eyes, though, but for the most part, it looked great. The budget also went into shooting a few scenes with IMAX cameras, and it was even going to have some sort of 3D component, but this would later be decided against by Alex Winter, who thought 3D was just too gimmicky. And how do you even do 3D through cable TV? And 3D TVs weren't really a thing yet. When it comes to the grand list of Ben 10 series and movies thus far in our journey of covering Ben 10, sadly, Alien Swarm may just be my least favorite entry into this world. I still enjoyed some aspects of the film, but in comparison, the lack of some levity really hinders what this movie could have been. In fact, we could have seen a third live action movie from Alex Winters continuing the older Ben story, but thanks to the CN Real era fading out and thinking back on Cartoon Network spending 40 million on the last production, Production, it just never worked out to become a reality. Alien Swarm is for sure watchable and has some really cool action scenes and some maybe over-the-top moody atmosphere and dialogue comes off as more campy to some, but so far this is easily the weakest Ben 10 entry we've looked at. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it though, of course, but with that being said, we have another set of tales to tell in the older Ben story. Let's take a look at Ultimate Alien. Why are you all looking at us like that? Alright, so now we enter Ultimate Alien. Rather than a new series, it just feels like a mid-season refresh, slightly changing the title, but the main core of the show is still the same. Every other series in the world of Ben 10 has drastically changed the style or tone of the show, and Ultimate Alien is just kind of more alien force. But now with the aliens being able to go ultimate. With that being said, the stakes here do continue to rise, with Ben and crew not being as restricted into where they can go. Being able to travel throughout the galaxy in the Rust Bucket 3. Now, with Ben being 16 and able to drive, there is a bit of a slight moving the characters forward in that scope. But for the most part, it's still Ben dealing with that ego that he got back. But to an even worse extent because we start this series with a bang. Or rather, a click, because his secret identity was published online thanks to his superfan, Jimmy. And just like that, Ben has to deal with everyone knowing that he is this hero. Which 
does come with a lot of unwanted attention. Well, Ben does like a lot of the attention and recognition sometimes. I mean, he wanted it all the way back when he was 10, but this also comes with a price on the family and friends of Ben. All of his enemies can easily get to him by going after the thing that can hurt him the most, family. Remember at the end of the last series, he gave Vilgax the Omnitrix to save Gwen and Kevin, or in the first series where he gave up the Omnitrix to save Gwen from Vilgax and Kevin? This just writes itself how easy it is to get to Ben now. This kind of causes a lot of older villains to make their series return from back in the original series and further some interesting dynamics with them. But just like Alien Force, Ultimate Alien is kind of split between two major arcs, one that is wholly unique to the series and one that has been building up steam in the background since the original series. So let's jump into what this first arc is. Our main baddie is Agrigor, an Osmosian, no, not the Jones variety, but of the Kevin variety as Kevin's part alien half is Osmosian. Agrigor is a collector going around the Andromeda galaxy collecting five species of aliens. You know, I'm something of a collector myself. His goal is to hook them up to his chamber pods and drain their powers into him to make him the ultimate Agrigor or whatever. A running theme in Ben 10 has been some form of draining power or energy and I guess we still have to deal with it more here. But uh oh, the five trapped aliens work together and plan an escape, causing them to all scatter all across Earth, which makes Agrigor have to go after them once again. Ben gets tangled up in the mix in some efforts to help them and at the same time of course scanning their DNA so he can have access to their species since they are all new to the Omnitrex being from Andromeda. Man, every time I say the word Andromeda, I'm reminded of one of the biggest bag fumbles in video game history. Ugh, disgusting. With help from the plumbers, Ben has successfully been able to get them on their way back home. It's a quick arc, nothing too massive here. Is what I would say if Agrigor didn't swoop in, wreck shop, and then proceed to recapture all those said aliens once more. Meaning all of that previous work was for nothing. But because of this, we get to know Agrigor's real plans here. Aside from becoming the ultimate version of himself, he is after the pieces of the Map of Infinity, a guide that will lead him to the four of creation where the celestial sapiens reside. They are the species of alien that Alien X is sampled from and he wants to absorb a baby celestial sapien. In order to stop Agrigor, Ben and the crew must work together with the help from Azmuth and Professor Paradox to try and collect these pieces first. It's like a nice scavenger hunt race, if it weren't for the fact that they continuously fail at this part and never seem to really get a one-up on Agrigor. This is a good place to point out the characters themselves at this point on the team and where their focuses lie. Gwen, while still being the glue for the team has more of an interesting story outside of the main story and I want to cover separately later on. Here, aside from Ben working on his leadership and learning to humble himself, has to learn how to drop the bad part of his ego and use the good that comes out to lead the team. Kevin goes through the most here in the series. Being an Osmosian himself, he feels this natural responsibility to take down Agrigor. We followed his personality growth through Alien Force where he genuinely cares for Ben and Gwen but still struggles with his old tendencies of the life of crime. While he has done more good than what can be considered bad, this power struggle of absorbing energy is what can be the catalyst to set him back in his old ways. By him absorbing matter, he is able to control his powers in his mind without worry, unlike what energy does to him. Through the events of dealing with Agrigor, this anxious feeling drowns Kevin in tempting him to absorb said energy, fully knowing what could happen if he did, but he holds on strong to not do so. We get our first dose of some timeline time travel when young Ben 10, at the age of of 10 comes to work with his older self, older Kevin and older Gwen. This all being explained as he came through the barrier of the Forge of Creation. Back in the OG series, we got a look at some possible future timelines that Ben could become and now with this instance, it kind of teases what we may look forward to in the following series. Multiple Bens from multiple timelines that are not canon anymore to this timeline, but their own timeline. This Ben, however, is the original Ben from the original series now having to team up with his older self six years in the future. His real purpose here serves as a mirror for modern Ben to look at, examining himself and who he was at a younger age. The other purpose is to still think that Kevin is a bad dude and helps incite one of the biggest problems going forward. When it's time for the big fight against Agrigor, Ben is basically defeated, leaving Kevin as the last resort to defeat Agrigor once and for all. But in order to take him down, younger Ben makes a judgment call to tell Kevin to absorb the energy from his Omnitrix. Hesitant at first, Kevin still does does this as it seemed that there was no other way, and in doing so, he becomes the Kevin-11 mutated amalgamation of aliens. Luckily, this was effective in taking down Agrigor. Unfortunately, those warnings and uneasy feelings of absorbing
absorbing energy came true as he is completely wrapped up back in his younger evil ways. This causes young Ben to gloat about him being right, but my dude, it was your fault. You said, hey, take some of this energy here and finish the fight, and now you blame him for going off the rails? Again, as much as we like Ben, he still kinda sucks. Little gaslighting jerk sent him back to the past. Kevin is now completely consumed by these powers and returns to finish off all that wronged him. From small petty loans of a few bucks to much bigger issues like hating Ben again for making him the way he is, going as far as to vow to kill Ben and Gwen, which adds stakes to the trio's relationship with Kevin over the course of the last series and this series. Ben and Kevin had become a lot closer and more brother-like while Gwen and Kevin have become a couple and now even her, the only one who in the beginning of Alien Force can get through to him, can no longer do so. Because of these tensions and these trials of trying to stop him, Ben sees no other way in taking Kevin down than vowing to do the same, and killing him. Grandpa Max offers some advice to Ben saying that this decision is probably the right one and would be the easier and smarter move. He does mention however that Ben has always come up with another and more peaceful way of handling situations. The conflict here is beyond personal and the weight that these issues hold on the whole team is heavy. Gwen, being torn up with all of this, constantly tries to stop them from fighting but to no avail. We learn a bit about Kevin's past as well, the mysterious stuff that happened to him between the original series and Alien Force, where in which he learned to get out of his monstrous state and harness his absorbing powers for matter instead of energy. But when things get too fierce, Gwen makes a judgment call and recruits a familiar face from the last series, Michael Morningstar, who now goes by Darkstar for help. See, I told you he'd be back later. Before using his expertise though, Kevin, while fighting Max, is confronted with a dude. A dude who happens to be his stepdad, Harvey, where we see a little taste of his home life when growing up. It's pretty powerful and emotional, but not as powerful and emotional as the group finally being able to turn him back out of his monstrous state. Okay, I lied. They just go back to normal and we act like nothing even happened. They also got to stop Darkstar from fully absorbing all his powers for evil. I'm sure he'll be back at some point. But before we go into the back half of Ultimate Alien and discuss the other really cool stories and major final arc, let's take a look at the Ultimate Aliens. Now, to go over every returning alien would literally take forever as there is a good mix of aliens who return, or at least are there, but they're never used. So let's just look at anything that debuted with an ultimate alien, and of course, the ultimate forms themselves. Ultimate Wild Mutt, he just becomes all red. And sharp. He's way more aggressive than just plain old Wild Mutt and can even speak now, so there's that going for him. Ultimate Cannonball just really gets some new armor over the top of his yellow spots, making them look silver. Oh yeah, he has these spikes now when he rolls around, so that's pretty cool and powerful. Ultimate Spider Monkey takes our lovable mix Spider Monkey Man and turns him into this large gorilla that is hoisted up in the air like Iron Spider. He's also purple now, which is Slick. The ultimate form here is a bit of a leap, but hey, he do just be chillin'. Ultimate Echo Echo sees this little dude as a good bit taller, which allows him to have a lot more of a powerful sonic wave attack, and can have the discs on him fully be controlled on their own. And he kinda just looks like Seismitoad from Pokemon. Ultimate Big Chill can now use fire abilities alongside his ice abilities, donning a spiky and cool red look with no noticeable growth in size. This one is definitely more powerful and speed based rather than anything else. Ultimate Swampfire becomes a whole lot stronger at the cost of speed. But who can complain when instead of fruit or berries growing off you, you essentially get some grenades. To boot, his flames are even hotter than before. Ultimate Humongosaur is just amped up Humongosaur even more, and coming in at twice the size of him as well. He gains a bunch of armor on his back, knuckles, and tail. He just looks like a grumpier hulk with a tail. Ultimate Way Big, of course, comes with some big style. Being the most powerful alien, well, Ultimate Alien. Alien X would still be the strongest, right? Okay, yeah, let's just go with that. His spikes get spikier and he's still th way big. Aside from all the ultimate forms, there are some redesigns of many of the older aliens and for better or for worse, since they weren't redesigned for the look of the show like Omniverse would next do, it just feels like they had to be different enough so that they can make more toys, which hey, 
I get it, but it's just hard not to be a fan of the original way that they looked, versus getting used to this new way that they look, especially since in the next two series of Ben 10, they're gonna change again, and again. There are also new aliens to Ultimate Force, which always are fun to see what else Ben is going to add to his roster, like the captured aliens Agrigor rounded up. Amphibian is from the Amperi species, resembling an elegant squid-like jellyfish design. Dealing in electricity, he can easily reach out and shock you. He can walk through walls hear and fly. He's much more unique than the other fish who can swim. Armadillo is from the Talpadian species and gives off those construction power tools armadillo vibes. I mean, he's just jacking Digmon's flow here. He's just only buffer. His arms operate as giant jackhammers and his strength is pretty high up there in terms of Ben's heavy hitters. Water Hazard is of the Orishan species, giving mad Mass Effect Krogan vibes here. He's able to shoot highly concentrated water blasts ranging in temperature. He has a nice balance of speed and strength, making him a well-rounded alien for battle. Terraspin is from the Geoshalon Aerial species. He's a dang turtle, and I like turtles! He's really cool and maybe one of my more favorite aliens ever. He can shoot out tornado-like gusts of wind, he's bulky and strong, plus his flippers become like knives when he's acting like a Beyblade. NRG is from the Pripiatosian B species. Having another one of those fun names, no, I did not say his name is Energy, I said his name is N. R G. Get it? Just like XLR8. Anyway, he's basically a furnace. Well, inside the furnace, he's this bright red radioactive being who just wants love. I added the love part. He just looks like he needs a hug. But if you're going to do so, please bring your radioactive suit and your Geiger counter. Between that and his use of lava from underground, he's a big bulking tin of pure red hot lava butt kicking. Yeah, that, that is an actual sentence I wrote. Chameleon is from the Merlina sapien species, and this purple spotted lizard can blend into his surroundings surrounding becoming invisible and can climb things very quickly and very well. Clockwork from the Chrono Sapien species is an egg timer, and when the timer is up, you get served a knuckle sandwich. I can't tell if that's a good joke or I'm severely sleep deprived trying to put this video together. The world may never know. Fast Track from the Citrakaya species is another blue speedster. That seems just a tad too redundant here. What do you want me to say? He runs fast. Accelerate runs fast. He looks cool if that's a plus I can say. Jerry Rig, a plancha hole species, is literally a little devil. Look at him. How can you not love this little old man looking gremlin? But staying true to his name, he can get up in some machinery and then just rip it all back into its basic parts. He's a quick and strong little dude and we respect him here on this channel, even if we can't pronounce his species name correctly. Eedle, an Orictini species, is like a beetle, if that beetle had a menacing sharp metal bite. He can eat pretty much anything and can convert what he eats into a form of energy. Now, this time I said energy, not an RG. <laughs> anyway, he's pretty quick and his head can be used as a good strong source to run into enemies. The new aliens in Ultimate Force are pretty cool cool, but we start to run into this problem of needing to create new aliens for both purposes of toys and to try to keep the show fresh and interesting. But while Ben can access his older aliens whenever as well, we run into a problem where newer aliens just become slightly tweaked versions of past aliens, either having straight up the same abilities or having those abilities and a lot more to offer, making the other classic legacy aliens feel obsolete and less effective for battle. But again, I do like a lot of the new new aliens and what they have to bring to the table, especially Terraspin. I just love big turtles. <gasps> <sighs> The back half of Ultimate Alien focused on the Forever Knights, an organization that made their first appearance all the way back in the first season of the original series, being a frequently used side villain plot that built up a lot of the lore for who they are and why they are around. Ultimate Alien finally opens up the full plans for them as they find themselves in the middle of this battle regarding an ancient dragon's resurrection. We meet Old George, the founder of the Forever Knights who gathers every sector of them back together as their missions of collecting alien tech and other shenanigans strays too far from their initial mission, to stop this ancient dragon from coming back to life and if it does, they need to take it down. Old George himself is an immortal who fought the ancient dragon back in the Roman era long ago. Azmuth actually knows Old George and in fact is the one who helped him defeat the dragon originally when he gave him an all-powerful sword thinking that he was worthy of it, similar to him going back and forth debating if Ben is worthy of the Omnitrix or not. On the flip side of things, there is another group called the Flamekeeper Circle, or as we 
call them the FKC. They actually worship the dragon and want to resurrect him. This dragon, however, was just in the form of a dragon and is actually this demonic multi-dimensional being whose goal is to invade this current dimension he is in. And his name is Dagon. And Dagon was once the dragon. The FKC have the ability to appear and disappear anywhere at any time thanks to their abilities to do so. I can't explain the science behind it, but it sure looks cool. At one point, they end up trying to recruit Ben to their side of the fight. But all it does for Ben is expose that the piece of Dagon that they claim to have is actually just the real version of Vilgax from when we last saw him at the end of Alien Force. Vilgax is actually just using the FKC as a form of harnessing the power of the Dagon. Once the Dagon is actually released upon the world, Vilgax is able to absorb him and essentially he becomes one with the Dagon. Asmith makes a choice saying Ben is worthy of the same sword that defeated the Dagon before, but Ben suggests that old George be the one to finish him, which he shouldn't have done. Leaves Ben with the sword, and once he picks it up, he is covered in armor fully, becoming a knight himself. He ultimately takes down the Dagon Vilgax mashup monster by absorbing him into his Ultimatrix, leaving a final choice of what to do holding the power of the sword, the Dagon, and the Ultimatrix. Vilgax tries to persuade him in what to do, like being able to rid all evil out of the universe, but that comes from the perspective of what the user deems evil. His other choice is to change everything back to normal that had been done to Earth alone with free will. With everyone pressuring him on both sides, he exclaims that they all be quiet, while he raises his sword and shoots out a beam that restores Earth back to normal, repairing everything and everyone, but at the cost of losing all the power that he had. Asmuth asks for the sword back, as well as Ben's Ultimatrix, which makes Ben think that Asmuth has lost trust in him fully, but he tells him that it's not you, Ben, that isn't worthy of the Omnitrix, but this inferior Omnitrix not being worthy of you. So he straps Ben on a brand new Omnitrix, but not just another updated version of it, it's THE Omnitrix. Not the basic one, the one that he's wanted all along from the start of even having the first Omnitrix. Just minus the master controls where Asmuth jokes to Ben that maybe on his 18th birthday he can have that. But really, this is all just a big tease for the next show, Omniverse. Even though the art style is completely changed in the next series, it's still a sequel to Ultimate Alien. Also, that whole ending with a final decision while wielding all that power reminds me of a similar ending in another man of action show, Generator Rex. Speaking of Generator Rex, in my video on that show, we talked about a special episode where this version of Ben 10 gets put into the world of Generator Rex. And it becomes such a fun team up episode dealing with the pocket dimension prison, a rogue prototype AI, and it being my multiverse of madness. Anyway, in that episode, however, we do get a look at another alien from Ben, Shock Squatch, a Gimlinopithecus species who, true to his name, is an electrical Sasquatch. But aside from that, there were a handful of really cool small or one-off storylines within the show that are worth highlighting outside of the main arcs. While still having a filler-ish feeling, at least these smaller storylines are pretty enjoyable. Like the Jimmy Kid who outed Ben as the hero he is, ends up having to help out on a mission which is a fun little way to use a character like him. It's like being a fan of Batman, and then one day Batman needs your help, then you go and become Robin. And I'm talking about the one that, you know, doesn't make it. There's this other character named Eunice, who comes to stir the pot up at one point, but something Things off about her. Hmm. Maybe it's the fact that she is a creation of Azmuth. She's literally a prototype Omnitrix. Azmuth's just one weird little frog thing. I also appreciated getting a little deeper dive into Azmuth's background. Getting to see him put more all into his work and research and his creations rather than the love of his life. Dealing with the questions that I proposed in the last video. Being this smart and creating something so powerful, but overlooking the bad side to it. The potential of what could go wrong. It's a fascinating little deep dive into Azmuth. Smith, and I appreciate that we did get a look into it. Eon from the first live action movie Race Against Time makes an appearance as the older evil Ben from a different timeline that isn't the Race Against Time timeline because that timeline wasn't his timeline either. But now he's in this timeline where he faces off against a future good Ben that is also from this timeline and isn't Ben 10,000 from that potential future timeline. He's a Ben 10,000 that has met that Ben 10,000 so it's stuck with this timeline not creating that timeline. Are you keeping up here? 
Let's check the whiteboard. Yeah, that's about right. We see other characters from the second live action movie, which we just talked about, Alien Swarm, which include Elena and Victor Validus. Just cool to see live action movie characters actually become cartoon characters. We still get a lot of Ben's relationship with Julie here, and now he struggles with having a relationship and dealing with, you know, all the universe saving stuff. We get to learn a lot of lessons for Ben through these interactions, making the time spent with her worthwhile for the viewer and these characters. Also, you all remember Albedo, the evil Ben clone we talked about from Alien Force? Well, he's still trapped looking like Ben, so without powers and now knowing of Ben's new fame, he tries to cash in on this by pretending to be Ben and putting on shows. Part of me says that dude kind of sucks. The other part of me is proud of his hustle and getting that bag. There's also this moment where all of Ben's ultimate alien forms escape from the watch and try and kill him. It's really reminiscent to the Destroy All Aliens movie when Ben in a dream sequence fights his escaped aliens. I say reminiscent in a sense where that Destroy All Aliens movie is about the young Ben 10 and I watched and covered it as a part of the young Ben 10 stuff in the last video, but the Destroy All Aliens movie would premiere after Ultimate Alien. So maybe the better phrasing here would be that Destroy All Aliens has a scene that is reminiscent to this moment in Ultimate Alien. Yeah. Whiteboard, same. I also really like this mini arc we get with Charmcaster, which if you remember is this rival character to Gwen. Although for this storyline for her, she's not as rage and vengeance filled towards Gwen. She's on a mission and that mission is to go into the Ledger Domain realm, defeat this magical entity and resurrect her father. And when she actually does do that, the father says, hey, why that's stupid, don't, I don't want this, and reverses everything that she worked for. He goes back to being dead, all the people in Creatures that she have killed all come back, and I can't even imagine what that does to a person. And luckily I don't have to, the show shows me. And through this she ends up becoming true frenemies with Gwen, and later on when Michael Morningstar comes back because, or sorry, Darkstar comes back, excuse me, she gets herself into this entanglement with him as he is seeking the ultimate power that she can give him as Gwen tries to warn her about his real intentions. But those come out anyway, Charmcaster takes care of business and just needs some time alone to process everything that's gone on in her life and to find herself. It's a lot of lore and character building and I like that we do get to focus on some smaller side characters like this every now and then. At the end of the day, this series had a lot of fun here that made the downtime between the major arcs a nice breather in between the larger and longer narratives. Plenty of callbacks and old characters make their way into the series, whether silly or serious, they were for the most part really crucial in world building and character building a lot of the more deep rooted lore within the Ben 10 universe. Something I appreciated and I'm sure big fans of Ben 10 also really appreciated. From Ben 10 to Alien Force to Ultimate Alien, the journey we have followed with Ben growing up as the multi-savior of the universe has been a wild ride thus far. From humble beginnings of a road trip to intergalactic space adventures filled with thrills and mystery, Ben 10 has felt like a thought out, well-written sci-fi action show that has a lot of heart, emotion, and thought provoking baked into the deep characters and intensive lore. The more you watch, the more connections you start to find. I think doing this series in succession, watching every episode and movie of Ben 10 ever is a lot to consume, but you remember so much more and are able to follow along and piece so much more together. If this were airing weekly and as spaced out as they were along with the limitations of cable TV and catching episodes in order, it does seem a bit daunting and could be confusing at some parts. Sure, there are plenty of episodes to just jump into and you'll be caught up, but on the other hand, there are so many episodes that rely on surrounding episodes to fully paint the picture of what's going on. So in hindsight, Watching everything in a binging fashion made this a lot more easier to digest and fully enjoy, but that's just me. I would love to know how you prefer watching the series now versus back when they originally were coming out. Now, of course, there are still a few things to mention from the world of Ben 10 during the Alien Force and Ultimate Alien era, like the video games, where we see a lot more than just the technical two that we had for the original series. First, we have, simply titled, Ben 10 Alien Force, released on the PlayStation 2, PSP, and Nintendo Wii and the DS. It follows story moments from the show as well as current enemies we've encountered in the show thus far. The next game is Ben 10 Alien Force Vilgax Attacks. I own this one for some reason. I didn't know my Ben 10 collection was growing this fast. I don't have a problem. You have a problem. Releasing on all the same batch of consoles and the Xbox 360, the game pretty much does the same as the previous game, only now dealing with the later arc situations with Vilgax, hence the title of the game. Ben 10 Alien Force 
course, The Rise of Hex was a lot smaller of a game. Releasing on the Wii and Xbox 360, this game takes the more open map style action game and turns it into a 2.5D side-scrolling game. However, the next game, Ben 10 Ultimate Alien Cosmic Destruction, brings us back into the open map brawling, dealing with the Ultimate Alien stories coming out on the PlayStation 2, PlayStation 3, PSP, Wii, DS, and the Xbox 360. But there is one final game that relates to this era of Ben 10, and honestly, it just may be the most important one out there. Ben 10 Galactic Racing. Yup, you heard that right. Ben 10 Galactic Racing is a racing game where you, your friends, and your enemies put down all that fighting nonsense for a bit and let off some steam on the track as you race in space. So that's pretty cool. It came out on all the above consoles minus the PlayStation 2 and PSP, and this time has versions on the PS Vita and 3DS. I do one day want to take a look at all these individual Ben 10 games over on my brand new gaming channel that is launching very soon, Jordan Fringe Gaming. Click the link below to check it out if you want to. I also want to give an honorable mention to a fun event that Ben 10 had, the Ben 10 10 10 Marathon. It was a five hour marathon of Ben 10 Ultimate Alien that would also premiere not just just one, but two new episodes of the show. Starting October 10th, 2010, fans could tune in and watch a bunch of Ben 10 goodness, as well as enter in on a contest to win the Ben 10 Ultimate Prize Pack using codes that would be shown off on TV and plug them in on their website, www.ben10ultimateprizepack.com. Hmm, a lot of thought into that website name for sure. Runner-ups would win stuff like action figures, DVDs, and several other items, all Ben 10 related. The top winner, however, would take home a cash prize, a framed leather Ben 10 jacket, and much more. It was a pretty clever concept for a date that would only happen once every 100 years, and this one just happened to come by as Ben 10 was on the air. Wow, that was nearly 12 years ago at the time of making this video. Time really just keeps flying by, and I just really want that jacket. Whew, after after all of that, we have reached the end of everything that I am more familiar with when it comes to Ben 10. In my first video, I spoke on how my original viewing of Ben 10 while it was premiering stopped during Ultimate Alien, with me never experiencing Omniverse, and to that extension, the reboot. But back then, I had no clue that Omniverse was a direct continuation to everything previously, based on the complete redesign of the characters and the art design in general making Ben look and feel younger again, I just assumed Omniverse itself was a reboot. That's what I get for assuming. I couldn't have been further from the truth in that aspect. So when we return in part three, we are entering an all new untouched territory for me. Hopefully for you as well when it comes to the reboot since many of you mentioned that you have not watched it or only seen a few episodes. Plus lots of other cool surprises to discuss in that video. So stay tuned for it. Thanks so much for watching through this. If you made it all the way to the end, make sure to comment that you watched the whole video. Hit the like button and subscribe for more content like like this, click the join button to become a member and help support the channel, follow me on Twitter, and I'll be back with another video soon, but until then, later.